prophecy of Isaiah. We've now reached presentation 25. God's future plans. God had revealed to Isaiah the coming situation that was facing his nation. The entire fabric of society of the people of Judah was simply falling apart and it wouldn't survive the onslaught from the empires and nations round about. The problems weren't really caused by Assyria or Babylon. They were caused by themselves. And Isaiah saw that exile in Babylon was inevitable. The nation wouldn't survive. But that raises the question. Away from their land, was there any future for the people? Did the persistent rebellion of the people of God bring ultimate rejection and God would just write them off and work through some other group? These are the big questions that Isaiah faced with his people. And if we ponder it today, they're the same questions that the church, the people of God, we are facing in the West. The fabric of our societies is falling apart. The problem is us. We've resorted and we've locked up God in our churches. We've privatized God, we've ritualized God. And is there an exile inevitable for us? It's beginning to show. Is there any future for the people of God in the West? Isaiah saw that the land would be sacked. He saw that Jerusalem would be flattened. He saw that the people would be taken into exile into Babylon, suffering greatly. All this was the inevitable consequence of their entire society falling apart because they had chosen not to go the way of God. They were in rebellion and they had lost their direction in life. They couldn't withstand the onslaught. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Is there a shaft of light coming to them? And over these chapters, Isaiah reveals new insights. As if God was showing them one thing after the other, ever increasing depth. What was going to happen? Where was it going? Was it a future? What was the plan of God? And this led Isaiah into new understandings. New understandings about God himself. His purposes for humanity, all human beings, and how God would take these purposes forward for the benefit of all of us humans. And amidst this he saw something of the future role of the people of God. The nation of Judah had been characterized by utter failure. The leadership particularly was guilty. They were developing into entirely being self-serving. Isaiah saw that the exile was an inevitable consequence and that in exile the people didn't have any answers in themselves. Self-effort was doomed to more failure. But there was hope, and Isaiah saw this, a hope for the future. Despite all the rebellion, God had not left his people. We need to hang on to that. <clears throat> his purposes remained unaltered. God was the Lord of the universe, the God of glory. He wasn't just some tribal God to be put alongside the gods of the nations round about. And Isaiah started to glimpse that a new king would come. The kingship of the past had so often failed. The nation had failed. But a king described as a servant king would succeed where the nation had failed. And as a result, the people of the world round about would be blessed through this servant king. But it all started when Isaiah began to grasp more about who God is, what he's doing, and what his purposes are. 
And perhaps that's the starting point for us in the West today. We've got to recapture and grasp the true nature of the Almighty God that should be the centre of all our lives. Let's move forward into chapter 41, starting at verse 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Tell us, you idols, what's going to happen. Tell us what the former things were, so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds, so that we may know you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. But you're less than nothing, and your works are utterly worthless. Whoever chooses you is detestable. Isaiah is mocking the idolatry of the nations round about. Today we don't worship our little idols physically. But in the West we have created terrible idolatry. We've worshipped possessions and what we have. But we've also worshipped our abilities, thinking that we can solve our problems and we know how to handle things on the way forward. And we only have to listen to our politicians to see that being reflected in what they say. Isaiah mocks them. He mocks the gods of the nations. And if Isaiah was standing here today, he would stand up and he would mock the way we in the West have created our gods. He would mock them. They can't interpret the past. They can't help us in the present. And they don't know what the future is. But God was revealing, the God of glory was revealing to Isaiah something of the future. And where our gods can't interpret the past to make sense of the future, Isaiah could see it. Because Yahweh, the God of Judah, was showing it to him. These idols are incapable of action of any sort. He mocks them. Do something. And by contrast, Isaiah is picturing the God who can and will reveal what will happen. The God, the Lord of the universe, who made everything, who is the Lord of history, who can make sense of what's happened in the past for us. And the God who is capable of acting and will act to rescue his people, if only we're willing to be rescued. But Isaiah also sees, and we'll find that later on as we've seen a bit in the past, the failed kingship, there would be a servant king coming who would succeed where the failed kingship had failed and where the nation had not achieved its goals. We've got to remember this. Predictions that are in the Bible, prophecy, looking into the future. Experts in the field tell us that if you look at the contemporary literature of the days of Isaiah, indeed the biblical days, there are no instances of this kind of predictions, the kind of predictions made in the biblical record because they tend to have a high level of precision. And we'll see an example in just a moment or two. And the kind of pagan temple oracles, which were so much part of the later Greek and Roman empires, they claimed to give predictions. But when you looked at them, they were so vague that almost any outcome could be a fulfillment. And you can see that exactly fulfilled in the writings of Notre Dame. You can interpret it any which way. It's too vague. And you can see it in the writing, <clears throat> the writings coming from Muslim scholars who are trying to pretend that there are predictions in the Quran, but they can be interpreted any way. They're too vague. 
and anyone looking at these things would laugh at them. By contrast, biblical predictions tend to have some kind of level of precision which says, well, that couldn't be a fulfillment, but that is. It's worth pondering. That's the God of the universe. Isaiah goes on, speaking the words of God, I have stirred up one from the north, and he comes, one from the rising sun, that's from the east, who calls on my name. So someone is coming from north, north by east, he treads on rulers as if they were mortar, as if he were a potter treading the clay. Who told of this from the beginning so that we could know, or beforehand so that we could say, he is right? Stop for a minute. That's precise. We have here a new ruler coming from the northeast, and he's going to trample down the empires of the day. And that is precisely what happened. Babylon was overrun by the Medo-Persian Empire, which came from the northeast. Let's go on. No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. That's, again, mocking the idols. I was the first to tell Zion. That's God speaking. Look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good news. Because that was the news that was needed because it allowed the people to come back from exile. I look, but there is no one, no one among the gods to give counsel, no one to give answer when I ask them, mocking the idols. <clears throat> See, they're all false. <clears throat> their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. Oh, in our today's society, we have so much talk and opinion and assertion <clears throat> spoken with an air of authority. Isaiah would dismiss this, dismiss it as wind and confusion. It's a biblical principle. Any prophecy must be tested by clear historical evidence, something objective. The principle is laid down in Deuteronomy <clears throat> and it says, If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. <clears throat> True prophets are known by the fact that what they say comes to pass. And God revealed to Isaiah that Assyria wasn't the ultimate threat, but Babylon would take the rebellious people into exile. That's what happened. <clears throat> He predicted and showed Isaiah that the exile would not last forever, but restoration would happen. That's what happened. And the restoration would come when a kingdom from the north of Babylon would conquer Babylon, and then come from the east. That's what happened. You see, the God of Judah, Yahweh, the self-existent one, the God of relationship, he is unique. He is the Lord of glory. He is the one over everything. He's got control of everything because he made everything. He's not part of the creation. You can't fabricate God. You can't fabricate any representation of him. Great principle that was laid down in the days of Moses. He controls the destiny of humanity. We think we're in control of our destiny. And in the West, you can see it writ large in all that's coming out through our media and through our politicians and sadly sometimes through our church leaders. Only God controls the destiny. And only he can reveal the meaning of what's happening. And Isaiah was passing that on. And only he can reveal what will happen. And Isaiah passed that on and it came true. <clears throat> That's the key role of the prophet, to make sense of what's happening. And part of that may be to say, well, this is what the consequences will be. Oh, how we need the great prophetic figures amongst the people of God in the West today, who can interpret what's happening and point to the inevitable consequences. 
And what Isaiah was saying, that the gods of all these nations, represented by wooden and metal artifacts, they can't interpret or predict. They're just hot air and confusion. And the gods of the West today are gods where we worship success, status, possessions, intellect, our abilities. They can't interpret or predict. They're just so much hot air and confusion. That's the picture of the days of Isaiah. <clears throat> Tragically, the people of God had failed. And Isaiah saw the land would be attacked by Assyria. It was. The land would be destroyed by Babylon. It was. Jerusalem would be sacked, burnt to the ground. It was. The temple would be raised to the ground, this magnificent building. It was. And the people were lost. Many of the leadership were executed. The last king was blinded. And they were taken away as refugees to a foreign land. Seemed no hope. Now Isaiah is saying, how do we make sense of this? Has God written us off? Is there any future? Are we finished? And he comes back with an answer. God shows him that the people of God, the people of Judah, Judah could be restored, would be restored. And that in due time, a new king would come. Born of the kingly line, but totally different. And he develops the picture over many chapters. But this king would put things right. What a magnificent picture. And here is that servant king. <clears throat> here is my servant, God speaking through Isaiah, <clears throat> whom I uphold. My chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. Remember, the islands is the symbolism for the distant nations in the world. A new king was coming, a new servant. And life would be transformed throughout the world. And here we have a picture of the coming servant who would be sent by God and equipped by God. His Spirit, God's Spirit on him. And he wouldn't come and throw his weight around. He wouldn't shout and bluster. He wouldn't harangue people. He wouldn't try to con people or push them around. But in quietness, humility, simplicity. And that very process takes all the evil of the world into himself. And it returns to the world as grace. A very deep thought there. Leadership so often ends up that way. Political leadership, you see great men and women go into political leadership and they have a genuine desire to do something for the benefit of those who have put them there. But the danger is so often that they end up dominating, lording it over others, thinking they have the answers. Often the problem's not caused by them, it's caused by us 
who encourage them to think this way, who adulate them, lift them high. That's not the way of the servant. <clears throat> he takes the things that are weak. The reed in the reed bread that's bent over, he doesn't break it. And you feel like a smouldering wick, your light is almost gone out. The servant doesn't snuff it out. He gently blows it and brings it back to life. I'm going to highlight this, but I want to leave it for a moment or two, because <clears throat> it will take a frame to explain it. That word hope, sometimes translated wait, but the word has the idea of something that's not a passive waiting. You're not just sitting around waiting for something to happen, sitting in our prayer meeting, wringing our hands. No. That word implies two things. We depend on God. So the far distant nations of the world will learn to depend on God. But it's a willingness to allow God to decide the terms. He knows what's best. He knows the way. And we start to reflect the servant by not pushing other people around or dictating what will happen. But we're living in hope for the God who is there for us. Now I said we come back to that phrase. Let me just move it up the screen a little bit. The word justice in the Old Testament the problem is that it is not exactly the same word as we might use it in English language today. I've pictured this at three kind of levels. Justice speaks of a behaviour. What we do as humans which is consistent with the way God relates to us. In a broad sense, it speaks of a societal order where the concerns of all are addressed. The great problem with the land of Judah was that the ruling classes were lining their pockets and fleecing the majority, who were getting steadily dispossessed and poorer. Their concerns were not being addressed, and the court system and the judges were in the pockets of the ruling class. If you look at the societal order of the empires and nations round about, there are parallels. Brute force, violence, those in power getting their way and the majority being pushed around and often exploited brutally. That's not justice. The overall picture might be seen as that. It's when the order in our lives individually, but more particularly in the life of our communities and society, when the order which exists there, indeed in the whole of creation that's round about us, it's functioning in the way God intended it to function. God made us and God knows what's best. And he knows what's best for us, not only as individuals, but as communities and families and nations and people groups. So when it says, in faithfulness he will bring forth justice, in faithfulness it could be almost in righteousness. God knows what's right and he will do it. He will see it through. And he will put things right. He will bring forth justice. He will bring a transformation to individual lives, but more importantly to wider society where all are important, the issues and concerns of all are addressed, and society and the way people behave starts to reflect the way that God designed us. God is love, and the word love means that each of us has our agenda, we're seeking the best for the other. Now that's the way God designed our societies to be. And if we lived with us, each of us, seeking the best for others, then our societies would be transformed. Now that's what Jesus did and it has reached to the far distant parts of the world. Just as Isaiah 
predicted it would. Justice in the Old Testament. But what about today? Slightly oversimplified, but there are three common approaches we see in our societies today. That occurred widely in the days of Isaiah. Those who were in power, ruling classes, the emperors, the kings, the army commanders, they imposed what they want, and the people didn't conform, brute force forced them to conform. Now you can see that today in the tragedies of fascism, communism, and Islamism. And if you look at these three, they all show the same kind of features as experts in the field have analysed and compared them. Now that's not Islam, that's Islamism. Nation states run under Sharia law. And essentially that's what happens. The few, those who are important and high places, they impose their way on the many. They justify their way by all sorts of reasons, but still it's their way. And the majority suffer. And looking at these objectively, you can see that pattern, and they still exist today in the world. The other common approach today is where we think we, as human beings, have the answers, or more accurately, we think the ruling classes have them. That wasn't so common in Isaiah's day, but it did show elements of existence in the coming Greek Empire. But we see it in the variant forms of democracy that exist in the world today. But in practice what happens is there are ruling classes. As someone said, anyone is able to be the President of the United States, but you have no chance of getting to the starting line unless you're a multimillionaire or have access to that kind of level of resources. There are ruling classes, and in Western nations in Europe, there are ruling classes, and they depend on their human wisdom. The justice that Isaiah was beginning to grasp and understand and see is that which comes from within us. It's not imposed from outside. And that is the Jesus way. Where driving each one of us is the desire for the best for the other, no matter who the other may be, whether they deserve it, what they've done to us, whether they can earn it or even give us anything back, that doesn't count. It's just because they're there and have a need. That's the Jesus way. And when we live that way, we don't have to have things imposed upon us by anybody because it comes from within. Oh, this takes a lot of thought and Isaiah was grasping this is the righteous way of justice, the way of faithfulness that God was going to bring in the coming servant king. What a beautiful picture. And to show that we're talking about Jesus, I've assumed that up to now, I've taken a little passage from Matthew, where Matthew says, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. He wasn't after the fame or reputation. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, and that's the passage we've just looked at that's quoted. And the New Testament writers see clearly, I've just picked one, that the references in the prophet Isaiah to the coming servant king were fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And the picture that Isaiah painted is precise enough. You don't see them fulfilled in anyone else. Jesus fulfilled them completely. But he calls us to follow in that way and start to reflect it. 
Jesus came to bring justice and faithfulness. He did what God wanted him to do and he was coming to put things right. And he didn't push people around. He didn't force anyone or anything. He didn't dogmatically insist on things. He didn't want the fame or the reputation. He wanted to release justice, freedom, hope to those around. Because that's justice. When we live our lives in line with God's design and purpose. And everyone benefits. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Picture of God the Almighty. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. This is what the coming servant king would do. And when it speaks about the creator, the word that's used there is creating something from nothing. He created the universe and he sustains it. And God takes the initiative. God sent Jesus into the world. And he sent him in line with his purpose, God's purpose, to do what was right and best for us. In that purpose, God would provide everything for the servant king, for Jesus. And it says here, I, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people. He didn't just come to fulfill the covenant. He came to be the covenant. And there's elements of that you can see when Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. Vested in me is the way and the future for mankind. Vested in me, in myself, is truth. Vested in me is life for you all. Vested in me, in Jesus the servant king, he fulfilled the covenant of God for the nations of the world. To release humanity from the grip of spiritual darkness, Oh, how we need that, how the world needs it. And it's there for us, Isaiah pictured us. And all of this has been fulfilled again and again as Jesus has released people groups from the grip of spiritual darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. God was revealing to Isaiah what would happen, and it did. And the word that's used there is Yahweh, the self-existent one, the God of relationships, the God that had been revealed to the people of Judah. And the tribal gods he mocks, they can't explain the past. They can't make sense of life here and now. They offer no resources for the present, and they don't give us any insights for the future. But the God who is the creator, the Lord of glory, he does it. He alone does it. And as he is giving her the contrast between the God of Judah and the gods, the tribal gods of the nations round about, made with wood and stone and metal. And then there's bursting into song. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You will go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them. That speaks of the far distant nations. Let the wilderness and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountain tops. That specific cities and nation groups round about. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise to the islands, the far distant nations. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. For a long time I've kept silence. I've been quiet and held myself back, God speaking. But now like a woman in childbirth I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known and along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. 
These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols and who say to images, You are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Historians tell us that there's no record of any other people group being restored to their homeland. Assyria and Babylon both had policies of deportation. In order to break the power of nations, they got them all mixed up. The only people group that went back to their homeland were the people of Judah. No wonder it's a new song for what God had done for them. And the celebration would be far and wide. From the nations close by, the people of God, to far distant lands. And that's happening today. God is not inactive. God may appear silent, but at the right time, in the right circumstances, he bursts upon the human scene with his activity. And Isaiah has given two pictures, a warrior picture. God is on the side of his people. If only we would listen to him and follow him. Turn from our rebellion. He'll fight for us. He's with us. He wants the best for us. He's not going to fight against others. He fights for us that we will be able to live lives rich and fully and completely in him. And a picture of childbirth after the period of waiting, of gestation, when not much seems to happen. Suddenly, the whole of the life of the family is turned upside down with the birth of a new child. God is not inactive. He's behind the scenes at work. And so often, and this is true today, we the people of God so often have lost our ways. We're running our religious systems. We've locked God up in our churches. We've privatized him. We have ritualized him in some of our churches. Self-induced spiritual blindness. It's parallel to the people of Judah. And someone who's blind, if the land is familiar to them, they can cope a bit. But if they're asked to go into unfamiliar surroundings, they're near helpless. We're going into unfamiliar surroundings in the West and we need God to guide us through. If only we'll listen. And let's recognize that. The things that we're depending on in the moment in our West, our power, our prestige, our reputation, our money, our resources, our religious pedigree, even our church leaders, we put them on platforms, we idolize them. That will all collapse, they're nothing, 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 just hot air. We've got to learn to come back and trust God and do it His way. An incredible picture. In life there are many periods of silence, I've picked up a few. There was the silence of the exile, stuck in Babylon, probably managing to survive by remembering things that Isaiah had said and Jeremiah, being helped along by Ezekiel who was bringing them more insights. Silence of exile before the restoration. There was the silence in Judah for about 400 years. There was the apparent silence in Christendom in the West when we got things so completely wrong. And I suggest we're moving into our inner period of silence in the West today. The great surges of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements have passed through. We have subsided back into our religious systems. Indeed, we have systematized the great working of the Holy Spirit. In our Western civilization, where we've created our own idols. In our Christian civilization of our church denominations, where we've also created our own idols and systems and rituals. 
There is silence. But there's also the silence that has come upon the suffering people of God, mainly in Islamic lands, but also in lands where totalitarian regimes rule. And the people there are crying out in their suffering. They're away ahead of us, because in the West we're not yet crying out. And of course there's the personal silences of life when tragedy or illness face us and we say, where is God in this? These are real issues and real problems. But Isaiah is talking about a nation. And for the nation, he is part of the answer. <clears throat> At an individual level, there may be more. And he's saying God is not silent. Under the radar, he's still at work. He's not inactive. He's doing things. And he still cares for you and me. Oh, hang on to that. The problem is we can't see what he's doing. But God is waiting for us to listen. He was waiting for the people of Judah to listen and they refused to listen. Oh, I say this gently. God is waiting for us in the West, the people of God, to listen. And to stop following our programs and agendas and to listen. To dethrone our gods and to listen. And God and Isaiah saw very clearly that God had given to the people of Judah his instructions for living. Much of that we can see in the first five books of the Old Testament that we have today. The word Torah literally means God's instructions. Not rules, instructions for our benefit. Treat them as a rule book, you'll fall flat on your face, no one can keep them. Treat them as instructions and directions, they're liberating. We have these and God is waiting for us to take them seriously and to put them into practice and to listen to what he has already said. Let's get back to our Bibles. Look at what God has already said. Isaiah has brought a magnificent picture. The message of Isaiah. The prophecy of Isaiah. The next presentation we're going to look at God's greater way.